Hardly any other group of extinct animals fascinates young and old more than dinosaurs. The Mesozoic era is often referred to as the age of the dinosaurs because these amazing animals evolved in the late Triassic and dominated the landscape for over 140 million years during the rest of the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. But even today, our planet is home to a myriad of different dinosaur species. But we're not talking about turtles, lizards, snakes, or crocodiles. We're talking about birds. From the smallest hummingbird to the ostrich, all of the 11,000 or so living bird species described today are real dinosaurs. But why are birds real dinosaurs, but lizards and crocodiles are not? Why are genera such as Ephigia, which look remarkably similar to our idea of a dinosaur, not dinosaurs but rather related to crocodiles? And why are genera such as Silosaurus, which looks so similar to the genus Ephigia to the layman, closer to dinosaurs, but are still not true dinosaurs. In the following articles, we want to explain why birds are dinosaurs and want to explore this on the basis of the fossil record, cladistics, and the anatomy of these animal groups. But before we do this, we must first classify what a dinosaur is, because this is the first step in recognizing why hummingbirds are dinosaurs, but monitor lizards, crocodiles, Silosaurus, and Ephigia are not. Dinosaurs are generally considered to be reptiles, while birds form a separate class that at first glance has very little in common with the class of reptiles. Looking at reptiles living today, such as snakes and turtles, they have characteristics that clearly distinguish them from birds. Reptiles have scales, are usually cold-blooded, have teeth, and their limbs, if they have any, are at the side of the body. Birds, on the other hand, have feathers, a toothless beak, can keep their temperature constant and their legs stand vertically under their bodies while their arms are transformed into wings. If we consider only reptiles and birds living today, a division into two classes seems justified. At the same time, however, both classes have certain things in common. Even though birds have feathers, they have reptilian-like scales on their legs and toes with claws. In addition, both lay hard-shelled amniotic eggs. Most reptiles and also birds have a so-called diapsid skull structure, i.e., in addition to the eye and nasal cavities, they have two characteristic temporal windows on each side of the skull. An upper temporal fenestra, which usually sits on top of the skull roof, and a lower temporal fenestra in the side wall of the skull. In the course of the evolution of reptiles and birds, this diapside skull base type was greatly modified, but can still be traced, for example, in embryonic development. Furthermore, researchers have noticed that within the reptiles, crocodiles have more in common with birds. This can be seen, for example, in the structure of the heart, details in the skull anatomy, or genetic characteristics. If we now include extinct representatives such as dinosaurs in this picture, the boundaries between dinosaurs, which are usually classified as reptiles, and birds become blurred. In biology today, Care is taken to ensure that all descendants of a common ancestor are always grouped together in the systematic classification of living organisms. Scientists call this monophily. Such a division into monophyletic groups is based on evolutionary novelties, apomorphies that only occur in representatives of this monophyletic group. We refer to such monophyletic groups as clades. Accordingly, this type of classification of living organisms is called cladistics or phylogenetic systematics. Each lower unit is part of the next higher unit. Cladistics classifies organisms into hierarchically nested groups that are defined exclusively by evolutionary novelties. This creates systems of natural classes with the greatest possible objectivity, which can be translated into kinship trees, cladograms, and these in turn into phylogenetic trees. However, the word reptile does not fulfill the criterion of a monophyletic group because it includes the dinosaurs but excludes the birds as their direct descendants, and is therefore a paraphyletic group, the term reptile is imprecise and therefore strictly speaking incorrect. For this reason, a different term appears in the scientific literature, which includes all reptiles as well as birds, sauropsida. In short, although dinosaurs had ancestors among reptiles and also close relatives such as crocodiles, even the first and most primitive dinosaurs were much more similar to birds than to classical reptiles. The sauropsida are divided into several clades, the two largest of which are the archosauromorpha and the lepidosauromorpha. 
The latter unite most classic reptiles, above all snakes and lizards, but also extinct groups like the plesiosaurs. The archosauromorpha can be further subdivided into the archosauriforms, in which the archosauria are nested. The archosauria then also include crocodiles, birds, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs. This detailed bifurcation of the different clades seems confusing to the layman, but is defined by the respective apomorphies that the corresponding clades exhibit. This graded hierarchy of apomorphies is one of the best evidences of evolutionary change, where evolutionary novelties define new groups. Especially for some original representatives within some clades, it is not always easy to distinguish to which clade they exactly belong. Unfortunately, we will have no choice but to use this phylogenetic tree as a guide to finally arrive at the dinosaurs. What features define the archosaur clade? One common feature of all archosaurs is their skull structure. Based on the diapsid skull type with the two temporal fenestra, the antorbital fenestra is located in front of the eye socket. In modern birds and crocodiles, however, there have been major variations with strong specialization. Although crocodiles have clearly pronounced temporal fenestra, their antorbital fenestra is closed. In birds, the antorbital fenest is only indistinctly delimited from the eye socket, and the temporal fenestra are small and also fused with the eye socket. The antorbital fenestra reduced the weight of the skull, which also allowed it to grow in size. The lower jaw originally had the mandibular fenestra, which is still present in crocodilians. The attachment of the teeth to the jawbone is the codontic, so the teeth each sit in their own tooth socket, where they are connected to the bone by connective tissue, and have no multi-part tooth roots. This feature has been lost in birds due to the development of the toothless beak, but is found, for example, in some extinct bird species such as Ichthyornis. Archosaurs also have a fourth trochanter on the femur. The fourth trochanter is a bump on the posterior medial side of the middle of the femoral shaft that serves as a muscle attachment, mainly for the caudofemoralis longus muscle, the main retractor tail muscle that pulls the femur posteriorly and provides a large attachment site for muscles on the femur. Unlike lepidosaurs such as snakes, archosaurs lack the Jacobson's organ, an olfactory organ developed in many vertebrates. These apomorphies of archosaurs are of course also found in dinosaurs. At the base of the archosauriforma are genera such as Euparcaria or Proterosuchus, which already share some, but not all, of the apomorphies of archosaurs. The archosaurs themselves can be divided into two clades, the Crurotarsi, or Pseudosuchia, which include the crocodilians and their diverse extinct relatives, and the Avametatarsalia, which include, among others, the Dinosauromorpha and Pterosauromorpha, but also some more primitive clades. The basal avametatarsalia include aphanosaurs, which are at the base of the avametatarsalia. Aphanosaurs exhibited features of both avametatarsalia and crurotarsi, suggesting that they are the oldest and most ancient known genus of avametatarsalians, at least in terms of their position in the archosaur family tree. The dinosauromorpha and pterosauromorpha are united as ornithodira. A distinguishing feature between crurotarsi and avametatarsalia is the structure of the ankle joint. The ankle joint is the connecting joint between the lower leg and the foot. The upper tarsal bones astragalus and calcaneus are involved in the ankle joint. The avametatarsals are characterized by a large astragalus and small calcaneus. The astragalus and calcaneus are both fused to the end of the tibia and fibula. The hinge of the joint is thus located between the astragalus and calcaneus and the second row of tarsal bones. This is referred to as a mesotarsal joint, a joint in the middle of the tarsus, and is found in all pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and thus birds. This design not only enabled better mobility, but also allowed the animals to move on their toes. All dinosaurs walked on the tips of their fingers and toes, and not on the palms of their hands and soles of their feet. This even applies to the heaviest giant sauropods, which still walked on their toes, but whose toe bones were squashed together into stubby columns due to their weight. For a long time, the crurotarsi were the preferred name for the crocodilian branch, as they were characterized by a pronounced ankle configuration in which the hinge of the angle runs between the calcaneus and the astragalus, with the calcaneus being larger than in the avimetarsalia. The astragalus is only fused to the end of the tibia, and the hinge runs between the calcaneus and fibula.
This arrangement means that crocodilians and their relatives appear with the entire sole of the foot. However, recent analyses have shown that some groups, like the phytosaurs, are more primitive than the other members of the crocodilian branch, so that the crocodilian branch is now referred to as pseudosuchia, and the phytosaurs are classified either directly outside the pseudosuchia or, in other cases, as primitive archosauromorphs directly outside the archosauria. Within the Ornithodira, the dinosaurs, along with several other taxa, belong to the Dinosauromorpha. Their sister group are the Pterosauromorpha. The Dinosauromorpha have some but not all of the apomorphies of dinosaurs. To the non-specialist, they look superficially like dinosaurs, but they are not quite dinosaurs yet. Some smaller genera such as Lagosuchus, Marasuchus, and Silosaurus are among them. Dinosaurs with their own apomorphies then emerged from these or similar forms. So here too, as with the Archosauromorpha and Archosaurs, every dinosaur belongs to the Dinosauromorpha, but not every Dinosauromorpha is a dinosaur. Which apomorphies characterize the dinosaurs? When the very first known dinosaurs were only Megalosaurus and Iguanodon and a few others, Richard Owen named and diagnosed them as a group of giant, extinct reptiles with a number of characteristic features. As the number of new dinosaur discoveries increased rapidly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, this definition was changed. By the time Samuel Wendell Williston published Osteology of the Reptiles in 1925, dinosaurs were clearly distinguished from other reptile groups such as marine reptiles, pterosaurs, and others. In 1878, Othniel Charles Marsh recognized four groups of dinosaurs, sauropods, theropods, ornithopods, and stegosaurs, groups that are still valid today. But few of these authors gave an accurate anatomical diagnosis of what constitutes a dinosaur. In 1888, the British paleontologist Harry Govier Seeley recognized two groups of dinosaurs, the lizard-like dinosaurs or saurischia, with which he grouped the theropods and sauropods, and the bird-like dinosaurs, or ornithischia, which included most herbivorous dinosaurs other than the sauropods. These ideas became widely accepted over the next 130 years, and most paleontologists agreed that a fossil had to belong to one of these two groups to be a dinosaur. However, Robert Backer and Peter Galton showed in 1974 that dinosaurs have a number of unique anatomical features that prove that they are a single natural group and did not evolve independently from different early archosaurs, the Thicodontia. As more and more fossils were found, the differences between the two groups of dinosaurs based on their hip structure appeared to be consistent, and the individual groups, sauropoda, theropoda, etc., continued to function well. The Saurischia were the dinosaurs with the lizard pelvis, where the pubic bone in the hip region pointed forward. In the Ornithischia, the bird-hipped dinosaurs, at least part of the pubis was shifted backwards, parallel to the rear bone of the hip region, the ischium. It is ironic that birds are derived from theropods, which had a lizard pelvis. The division into these two dinosaurs groups, which has existed since 1888, was well before the time when the relationship between dinosaurs and birds was clear. The similarity between the pelvis of Ornithischia and birds is also only superficial and not an indication of an ancestral relationship. More on this in the next articles. However, the main suborders of dinosaurs diagnosed by Seeley did not answer the question of how the groups within the Saurischia and Ornithischia are connected. As late as the early 1970s, paleontologists were still not sure whether Saurischia and Ornithischia could be grouped together as dinosauria. In his 1955 textbook, Evolution of the Vertebrates, Edwin Colbert wrote that the term covers two different orders of reptiles. Consequently, the word dinosaur is now a convenient colloquial name, but not a systematic one. This sad misunderstanding may have been typical of the thinking in the 1950s and 1960s when the first two editions of Colbert's book were published. But unfortunately, the text remained unchanged in the latest edition of 2001, when this idea was resoundingly debunked. This was because biologists and paleontologists in the 1970s and 1980s began to use cladistics as a classification method, looking for unique evolutionary novelties that define natural groups and moving away from so-called wasteback groups, which were unnatural assemblages of unrelated animals. 
A number of anatomical features are now known to define dinosaurs. One of the most important was defined by Jacques Gauthier in 1985. This concerns the acetabulum, the area of the pelvis in which the femur is inserted. In many land animals, the acetabulum is closed, but in almost all dinosaurs there is an opening, the acetabulum, that passes directly through the hip bone. Finally, there are only three vertebrae, which are fused to the upper part of the hip bones, connecting the spine to the hind legs and forming a sacrum. Other animals have fewer or more vertebrae in their hips. Dinosaurs have legs that are under the body, whereas in other reptiles they are on the side of the body. This position of the legs not only allows more efficient locomotion, but also enabled the gigantism of many dinosaur groups. As mentioned, all archosaurs have a fourth trochanter, but in non-dinosaur archosaurs such as crocodilians, the fourth trochanter is rounded and symmetrical. In dinosaurs, the trochanter is clearly asymmetrical. It is assumed that this asymmetry may also have played a role in supporting their upright posture. On the upper arm bone, humerus, dinosaurs have an elongated deltopectoral ridge. Two muscles attached to this, the deltoid, the muscle on the outside of the shoulder, and the pectoralis, the chest muscles, hence the term deltopectoral. A longer attachment point for these muscles indicates greater strength in the forelimbs. Dinosaurs also have a number of unique features in their skulls that distinguish them from other reptiles. They all lack the postfrontal bone, a small bone in the roof of the skull, the ectopterygoid overlaps the wing bone in the palate, the head of the temporomandibular joint is exposed in lateral view, and the post-temporal opening at the back of the head is smaller. Other anatomical peculiarities of dinosaurs were a backward-oriented shoulder joint socket, asymmetrical hands with shortened fourth and fifth fingers. In many species, these were missing altogether. The nemial crest, a crest-like elevation at the upper end of the tibia, an upward-pointing projection on the astragalus, and an S-shaped curved metatarsal bone. Many of these features, which at least the earlier dinosaurs from the Triassic and early Jurassic still share, have been lost or changed in later developed dinosaur species over the course of time. The anatomical blueprint of a Cretaceous dinosaur can therefore already differ greatly from that of a Triassic dinosaur. Further characteristics of dinosaurs include the cardiovascular system and the structure of the lungs, but these will be discussed in later chapters, especially in relation to birds. Now we've finally done it. Sauropsida, Archosauromorpha, Archosauroforms, Archosaurs, Avametatarsalia, Ornithodira, Dinosauromorpha, Dinosaurs. Sorry if I have forgotten or skipped some clades in between. Thanks to anyone who has made it this far in this confusing name game. We now know what a dinosaur is and by which characteristics you can recognize one. But we haven't really reached the dinosaurs yet, let alone the birds. When we talk about the transition from dinosaurs to birds, it is not only their place in the family tree that is interesting, but also the decisive evolutionary transitions that took place. And one thing is certain, these are very well documented and proven. But in the next episode, we will focus on the non-avian dinosaurs, because these two not only have an astonishing diversity, but also some interesting evolutionary transitions. So if you want to know how some carnivorous dinosaurs became pure vegetarians, and how small dinosaurs became large creatures such as Brachiosaurus and Argentinosaurus, take a look at the next episode on this topic.